Hello, my name is Penny Lewis and I'm the subject advisor for P in Sport. I've spoken to many teachers and I know there is a lot of anxiety about both the new and additional content for the GCSE P specification and also about preparing candidates for the questions in the exam, in particular the extended writing questions. To help teachers with the delivery of the theory, we have produced a topic guide for each of the six topic areas and I would strongly recommend you look at them. They can be found on the website on the GCSE P specification page. Today I'm going to be looking at component 2, movement analysis, and demonstrate how you could deliver the component. One of the most important things to keep referring back to are the assessment objectives. There are three assessment objectives for external exam. AO1, knowledge and understanding of factors that underpin performance and involvement in physical activity and sport, and this is 25% of the overall qualification. And this will assess candidates' ability to recall information. AO2, apply knowledge and understanding of factors that underpin performance and involvement in physical activity and sport, and this is 20%, and this will assess candidates' ability to apply their knowledge. And finally, AO3, analyze and evaluate the factors that underpin performance and involvement in physical activity and sport, and this is 15%, and this will assess candidates' ability on their analysis and evaluation. That means that on the paper, 25% of the overall marks on the qualification will be on their knowledge and understanding. For example, can a candidate recall the information from the spec? Can they list or name the planes of motion or axes of rotation? 20% of the overall marks on the specification will assess the candidate's ability to apply their knowledge. Can they apply their knowledge of methods of training to a particular sport or activity? Which is the most appropriate method of training for a long-distance runner? and 15% of the overall marks on the specification will assess the candidate's ability to analyze and evaluate. Can they uh, evaluate whether intrinsic or extrinsic feedback is most appropriate for an elite tennis player, for example? Throughout the whole of this presentation, I will be making constant reference to these assessment objectives. AO1, recall, AO2, application, AO3, analysis and evaluation. Many teachers have been concerned about what we expect from candidates, and in order to access the full marks, candidates are expected to show their understanding. Teachers often ask what is expected in a response that assesses AO2 application and AO3 analysis and evaluation. The best way to demonstrate AO2 and definitely AO3 would be through writing a developed statement. Therefore, when answering the question that assesses AO2 and AO3, candidate must first make a point that is relevant to the question, what are you saying? Secondly, how? How is it applied to the question? How is the point you've made relevant to the question? And finally, why? They must be able to say why the point they've made is beneficial. Why is a point important? Why is it relevant to the question? What, how, and why? Other centers use the following. P, making the point. E, explain the point in relation to the question. And B, the benefit, what is the benefit in relation to the point made, P-E-B, PEB. If you deliver each component in this manner, then candidates will get used to writing developed statements, and then they'll find the question that assesses AO2 and AO3, including the extended writing questions, more accessible. Looking at the component of movement analysis, what do candidates need to learn? The aim of the component is to develop knowledge and understanding of the basic principles of movement and their effect in physical activity and sport through the following two areas. Levers, examples of their use in activity and the mechanical advantages that they provide in movement. And the second area is planes and axes of, mov of movement. We'll look at each of these areas individually and how you can prepare candidates to be able to answer all different types of questions from multiple choice to extended writing questions. Looking at the lever systems, candidates must have an understanding of the three different types of levers, first, second, and third class levers, and their use in physical activity and sport. Candidates must also have an understanding of the mechanical advantage and disadvantages in relation to loads, effort, and range of movement of the body's lever system and the impact on sporting performance. So let's look at the assessment objectives. AO1, what do they need to know? What do they need to be able to recall? Well, what are the names of the three different levers? 
There are first class levers, second class levers and third class levers. What are the names of the components that make up each lever and the recognized shape used to depict a lever system? The fulcrum, which is identified with a triangle. The load is usually identified with a square. The effort is usually identified with an arrow. And finally, the lever arm is usually identified with a straight line. Candidates must be able to sketch and label each of the lever systems, placing the components in the correct order for a given system and recognize the different levers in the body. And what do the parts refer to? The lever is a rigid bar that rotates around a fixed point and is used to apply force against resistance. And in relation to the body, the lever usually relates to the bones, the bone or bones. The fulcrum usually relates to the joints the point around which the lever rotates. The effort relates to the muscles, the force that is applied by the user of the lever system, and finally, the resistance or the load to the weight of the body part or anything that it is holding, for example, the force that is being applied. The levers are classified according to the placement of the fulcrum, effort, and load. The first class lever system is effort, fulcrum, and load. And if you think of a seesaw or scissors, the fulcrum is in the middle and the load and effort are at either side. The second class lever system is fulcrum, load, and effort. And think of a wheelbarrow. The pivot or the fulcrum is at one end with the load in the middle and the effort at the other end. And the third class lever system is fulcrum, effort, and load. And think of fishing or a stapler where the pivot or the fulcrum is at one end with the effort in the middle and the load at the other. Let's have a look at some examples. The first class lever system, the seesaw, effort, fulcrum and load. The fulcrum is in the middle and the effort and load are at either side. There are not many first class levers in the body. An example would be a tricep dip. The fulcrum is, is in the middle and the load is a weight on the hand and the effort is applied um, and the effort applied is on the triceps. An example of a second class lever system is a wheelbarrow. The fulcrum is at the end and the load is in the middle and the effort is at the other end. Again, there are not many examples of second class levers in the body. One example is a calf raise. The load, which is a body weight, sits between the toes and the balls of the feet, which is a fulcrum, and the effort is a calf muscle to raise the heel. An example of a third class lever system is a fishing rod, where the fulcrum is at the end, then the effort and the load is at the other end. The effort is applied between the fulcrum and the load. Most of the levers in the body are third class levers because the effort is applied between the fulcrum and the load. A bicep curl is an example of a third class lever system because as the effort is applied by the biceps, the muscle which is between the fulcrum, which is the elbow joint, and the weight in the hand. Candidates must be able to apply their knowledge of the lever system by using examples to show that each, each type of lever in the body. This is assessment to, uh, objective two of application. And examples in the body. The first class levers are limited within the body. One example in the body is um, where the neck is a fulcrum and the load is a head and the effort would be the muscles moving the head. Another example, would, as I've already said, would be tricep dips. The elbow joint is a fulcrum in the middle. The load is a weight of the hand at one end, and the effort is a tricep muscles at the other. A good sporting example is an oar in a boat. A rower applies effort by pulling on the oar on one end, and this applies force on the water, which is a load, with the attachment of the oar to the boat being the fulcrum. An example of a second class lever in the body is where the fulcrum is a joint at the ball of the foot, the muscle is the effort allowing the performer to go up on their toes and the body weight is a load acting downwards. In the third class lever system, the effort is applied between the fulcrum and the load. Most of the levers in the body are third class levers. For example, when doing a bicep curl, the elbow is a fulcrum, the bicep provides the effort to lift the arm at the elbow. Another example is flexion at the knee or the elbow. These are examples of third class levers, for example, action in breaststroke during the pull or bending of the arm to hit a tennis ball. 
the elbow is a pivot, the bicep the effort, and the racket or the ball is a load. Or preparing to kick a ball, the knee is a pivot, the leg or the ball is a load, and the hamstring is the effort. Most exercises use third class levers, but as just explained, there are examples of movement in the body which, is, which uses first and second class levers. Candidates must also know and understand the mechanical advantage of each lever. So considering the first class levers, a first class lever allows a given effort to move a heavier load with little effort. First and second class levers have a mechanical advantage as they can move a heavier load, they are also more stable. But the disadvantage of a first class lever is that they're unable to move as fast as third class levers system. The mechanical advantage of the second class levers, it's similar to the first class lever, the mechanical ad advantage is that they can move a heavier load. The longer the lever arm, the easier to lift the heavier weight. Think of a wheelbarrow. But the mechanical disadvantage is that a load cannot be moved far or quickly because effort is applied further away from the fulcrum. Looking at the mechanical disadvantage of the third class lever first, the effort arm is short, so muscles have to work harder to lift the load. The effort required is greater than the force exerted on the load. But the mechanical advantage of third class levers system is that the load moves further, giving a wide range of movement, so can gain speed. There are many sporting examples, for example, hitting a, a tennis ball with a racket, the third class levers um, the load travels much further than the effort and so you can hit a tennis ball harder and with greater speed. Candidates must be able to understand the mechanical advantages and disadvantages of each lever. The most efficient arrangement in terms of being able to lift the load, the least efficient, how far along the lever arm and fulcrum should be for the most efficient movement. Regardless of the lever type, all levers have the same principle. A longer effort arm than resistance or load arm gives a mechanical advantage. Further away the fulcrum is from the load and nearer to the effort, the harder it is to move and that's a mechanical disadvantage. The final assessment objective is analysis and evaluation. Candidates must be able to analyse and evaluate the mechanical advantages and disadvantages or evaluate how a system works to bring about the most efficient movement. There is a question in the SAMS on levers and the question says analyse the role of first class lever system affecting the rower's performance and there's three marks. The question asks for analysis of the role in affecting the movement. So looking at how a candidate could answer this question th uh, through using the method we discussed earlier or writing a developed statement. So what, what, is a, what point are they making? Well, first class levers allow the movement of a large load. And how, or explaining, explaining it, it allows minimal effort is required for that movement. And why, or what is a benefit? Well, the benefit is that the rowers can move the boat through the water with less physical effort. Rowers need to be able to apply a relatively small amount of muscular effort to achieve a high propulsion through the water. The role is to move the boat as quickly as possible with the least amount of effort. That's a mechanical advantage of this type of lever system. Candidates could also show knowledge and understanding by making reference to the mechanical advantage. If the fulcrum, which is where the oars attached to the boat, was moved further away from the load, from the boat, or and nearer to the person applying the effort, it would be harder to move. The best mechanical advantage is longer effort arm than resistance or load arm. And just to inform everyone, if there is a potential for ambiguity as to what, where the pivot lies in the question, this will always be stated in the question as in the SAMs. I am aware that some candidates may find this a difficult topic. However, if there was an extended writing question, candidates should be, achieve, should be able to achieve some marks. The extended writing questions could be assessed on any area within the specification. Please remember that each extended answer question will be used to assess the learner's ability to demonstrate knowledge and understanding, AO1, applying their knowledge and understanding, AO2, 
and analyze and evaluate relevant knowledge and understanding AO3. Each of these assessment objectives will be credited with a maximum of three of the nine available marks. This means that a learner who is knowledgeable about a topic but unable to apply their knowledge could still gain three marks for their, their knowledge. If they are able to apply knowledge, the number of marks gained could increase to six. And if they're able to uh, uh, form a judgment based on knowledge presented, um, they will be able to access the final three marks of the question. Therefore, even if a candidate found a topic area difficult, they could be awarded some marks for AO1, which is recall. The second part of the component is about planes and axes of movement. I understand that different texts may use slightly different terminology, but for GCSE PE specification, candidates must develop knowledge and understanding of the movement pattern using bodies and planes. And for the purpose of the GCSE PE specification, they must be taught the following terms. Sagittal, frontal and transverse plane, and frontal, sagittal and vertical axes. They must learn about the movement in the sagittal plane about the frontal axis when performing front and back tucks or pike somersaults. They must also learn about the movement in the frontal plane about the sagittal axis when performing cartwheels. And finally, they must learn about the movement in the transverse plane about the vertical axis when performing full twists in trampolining. Looking at the AOs, candidates are expected to know and understand the names of the three planes their location and how they divide the body. For example, the sagittal divides the left and right side of the body and the line is vertical. The frontal divides the body, the front and back of the body and again the line is vertical. And the transverse divides the top and bottom of the body and the line is horizontal. So looking at a diagram, the first person shows a transverse plane. This divides the top and bottom uh, of the body horizontally the second person shows a frontal plane, this divides the front and back of the body vertically, and the third person shows a sagittal plane, dividing the left and the right side of the body, and the line is vertical. Just like the planes, candidates must know and understand the axes of rotation. They must be able to know the names and be able to identify them. Frontal runs through the body horizontally from left to right. Vertical runs through the body vertically from uh, top to bottom and sagittal runs through the body horizontally from, left, uh, from front to back. Again, looking at the diagram, frontal runs through the body horizontally from left to right, vertical runs through the body from top to bottom, and sagittal runs through the body horizontally from front to back. Looking at the assessment objective two, the application, candidates must be able to apply their knowledge to different sporting examples. For examples, for example, the axis and plane of motion of a tuck jump about the hips, or a cartwheel, half twist, seat drop, etc. An example of some movements could be frontal plane, side to side movements that occur in the frontal plane, such as raising your arms or legs out to the side, like in a star jump or the transverse plane, twisting or rota rotational movements occur in the transverse plane, such as twisting your head from side, side to side. Or the sagittal plane, front to back movements occur in the sagittal plane, such as walking, pushing, pulling and squatting. This is an example where they could also bring in knowledge and understanding of physiology and anatomy, what mo movement is being applied at a, jo a joint flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Which plane axes are you rotating around? And finally, looking at AO3, analysis and evaluation. The third assessment objective could be assessed either in an extended writing question or somewhere else in the paper. In the SAMS, there is a question analyze how the following parts of the lever system allow the weight trainer in figure five and there is a picture of a weight trainer to lift the weights of um, the one part, the fulcrum, and the second part, the effort. The responses could be that the elbow is a fulcrum which allows the arm to bend or flex. The effort is a bicep muscle which allows a weight lifter to lift the weight or the load and one mark would be allocated for linking the relevant body part to the correct component. 
of the lever system and one mark for linking this component to lifting the weight. And finally, this final uh, slide shows my contact details. I hope that you found the session helpful and please do not hesitate to contact me if you need any further information. You can always contact me via telephone 0207 010 2188 or via email at teachingpe and sport at pearson.com. Thank you.